close the first game, yeah. but man, I thought that had been obvious. So, First Samuel. Bible reads in First Samuel chapter one. That there were, now there was a certain man of Rapheth, Rapheth, Ramath, Am Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Alkina, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice in the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time, and, and when the time was that Alcana offered, he gave Penina his wife and, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as, and, and as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up, and so Hannah rose up after that they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by, uh, by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she bowed a bow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a, a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that El Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, when she spake, she spake in her heart, only, with her, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long would thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have, have I spoken hitherto. <coughs> then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went uh, her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And she wrote, they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, and she, the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after uh, Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Behold, I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up, and the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou hast uh, weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I have asked of him. Therefore also, uh, therefore also have I lent him uh, to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he, she, and he worshiped the Lord. Excuse me. And he worshiped the Lord there. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, again, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the many uh, books that we get to read from. I pray that you would help me as I begin to preach through this book, of First Samuel, that we would uh, glean many spiritual truths from it, that we'd be edified, we'd be encouraged. Lord, that we'd be rebuked when necessary. Lord, that we would be... Um, just made better for having read through this book and preached through this book. Lord, I pray you be with me tonight. Help me to um, preach with boldness, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so 1 Samuel, of course, is probably one of the more famous uh, books of the Bible. It centers around uh, several very uh, famous characters, characters like, of course, Samuel and King David and King Samuel, as well as others. And, uh, you know, starting right out here, uh, we'll just jump right into this first chapter where the Bible reads, 
Now there was a certain man of a Raphaim of Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, and Ephratite. And he had two wives, the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. So right out of the gate, you know, this is something, every time you kind of come across a passage that, that uh, gives you the opportunity to um, teach this principle of Bible study, it's good to do it. Because uh, the, there's, a, there's a principle that in, when you're studying your Bible that has to be nailed down. A lot of people get hung up and they get mixed up and they get confused. They write emails, they ask questions, they, 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 they don't understand some stories in the Bible because they, they don't understand this principle. And this principle is this, you have stories and you have commandments, and they're two different things, okay? Now, what is the story here? It's talking about this man, Elkanah, right? But it says here that Elkanah had two wives, all right? Now, is that, is that the Bible telling us to have more than one wife? Nope. No. That's the Bible just telling us what Elkanah did, okay? You know, and that's a that's a, a very important principle in Bible study. You know, and every time you come across an opportunity to drive that home, it needs to be done because I see a lot of people get mixed up that way. You know, here's the problem: you're going to get into the latter chapters of John, you're going to get to the part where Judas hung himself, and you're going to think you should go do that, right? If you're going to have the, you know, no, that's just the Bible telling you what happened, okay? Right. <laughs> or Judas, that rather. But here's the thing: you know, he had two wives, but does that mean what he? Is that something he should have done? No. Now, we're going to read here in a little bit some other things about Elkanah. Now, I do not believe that Elkanah was a bad guy. I don't think he was a wicked person. I don't think he was an evil man. In fact, I think Elkanah was a pretty good guy. You know, what this shows us is that, you know, even good people in the Bible and even in our own lives and even we ourselves, you know, we could be good people and still make mistakes. You know, we're all going to commit sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Elkanah is no exception. You know, so let's not just jump down Elkanah's throat here right out of the gate. You know, and start and just start immediately thinking that he's some kind of bad dude because he did something he shouldn't have. You know, there's a lot of great men in the Bible that made mistakes. You know, we just read about one over the last, you know, book called Moses. He made a mistake, right? And he was a great man of God as well. So no, he should not have had two wives, but that is what happened, and the Bible is just simply narrating, just simply telling us, hey, this is what happened. Okay? Important Bible study principle. Verse 3, he says, And this man went up out of his uh, city yearly to worship and sacrifice the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. So here we see something else about this guy, Elkanah. You know, he's a faithful man. You know, yeah, he made mistakes, but, you know, he also got some things right. I mean, he's going up to Shiloh every year. He's making his sacrifices. He's, and he's a faithful man to the house of God. He goes on and says, And the two sons of Eli and Hophni, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. We'll talk about them later. And when the time... Uh, that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughter portions. So he's making sure everybody's got their portion to go up there. When they go up there year by year, so he's a faithful man. But he made some, he made this mistake here in marrying two wives. It says in verse five, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. Now, what does it mean by worthy? I believe what he's talking about is a double portion. Often you'll see that somebody is given a double portion of something, and that makes sense because it says for he loved Hannah. You know, so if he loves Hannah, he's going to give her more. What it's showing is that he favored her over his other wife. Uh, but the Lord had shut up her womb. Now, it's interesting that, you know, he, get, he loves her. You know, and I want to point this out, too, that he loves her. He gives her a worthy portion, but she, she bare him no children. You know, she was barren. The Lord had shut up her womb. And I think that's something we can learn from. And, you know, you know that's a, we could look to a hand, uh, excuse me, um, Elkanah here and learn something from him. You know, is that we should love our spouses despite maybe perceived uh, flaws that they have. You know, and I don't know that Elkanah said, you know, faulted Hannah for this, uh, her barrenness. Maybe he kind of understood or knew that the Lord, you know, that was the Lord that opened and shut the womb and all of that. But, you know, he didn't fault her for it. You know, and that's something that we should learn as husbands as well and wives, you know, as spouses. Is that if our, if our spouse has some kind of a fault, that doesn't mean you can't love that person. And I'm sure Hannah loved Elkanah right back, besides the fact that he had married another wife, too, <clears throat> which is probably not easy to do. But what that shows us is that, you know, no spouse is perfect. And you should love your spouse for who they are, not necessarily just what they can offer you. You know, he loved Hannah, but she, well, you know, she wasn't bringing him children. You know, and back then, you know, and even today, it's still the same, even though the world doesn't embrace this philosophy. You know, having children was what was expected of a wife. 
You know, there weren't all these strange, you know, I'm sure they were out there, but people weren't, you know, wholesale embracing, you know, all these birth control methods. Right. You know, having children was a big part of, of life. Like, it was something that they wanted. You know, they wanted to have a lot of children. And uh, that should, you know, that should be our attitude today. Amen. So what I'm trying to point out here is the fact that, you know, Elkanah could have gotten bitter. He could have said, look, I married you. You haven't born me any children. You know, what's wrong with you? And start, you know, picking at her. You know, and we can apply this to any, any fault that our spouses have. You know, we could, we could look at our spouses, and, and if we really wanted to, under a microscope, we could start to pick them apart in our minds, and maybe, maybe even go so far as verbally expressing them. But that's not the right thing to do. That's not what you do to somebody that, that loves you, or that you don't do that to somebody that you love, rather. Now, of course, there's a time and a place to express grievances and to lovingly correct somebody and to help, you know, let your, your feelings be known, but not in a bitter, angry, resentful way. You know, we shouldn't harbor those type of feelings. And I think that's a great example that Elkanah gives us and shows us the kind of man that Elkanah was, you know, faithful to the house of the Lord. You know, he gave us portions. He made sure those that were in his family and had their offerings to give to. You know, he was bringing up his family, his sons, his wives, his daughters in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, and he loved his wife. You know, despite the fact that maybe she wasn't, uh, you know, living up to her end of the bargain, so to speak. You know, and he, maybe he understood all the reasons why. Maybe he didn't. The Bible isn't really, isn't really clear. But it's easy to see why he lied. You know, I look at it, humanly speaking, I go, well, I could see why he loved her more than Penina. When you continue to read on. Because this Penina girl, this, she's pretty catty. You know, she doesn't seem like a very a nice person. You know, <laughs> look at verse 6. And her adversary also perver- provoked her sore. Now that's talking about the other wife there, okay? <laughs> For to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. So it's not even her fault, but she's, you know, provoking her. You know, why are you having any kids? What good are you? I mean, who knows the type of nasty thing she's saying? You know? And she and and as he and and as he did so, year by year, she went when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. So it wasn't just a one-time thing. Just year by year, this lady, just every year, year by year, it's just provoking her, rubbing her face in it. Oh, look how I had, I, how many more kids have you had this year? Oh, you haven't had any kids. Oh, you're still useless, right? And I guess the point where it, it bothers her so much that she weep, it says there, therefore she wept and did not eat. I mean, she was so troubled and so bothered by it. I mean, nice lady, Panina, right? Real compassionate, real understanding. No. I mean, she's, she's a witch. You know, she, this, is, this is not a good person in my opinion. I mean, what else do you read about her? <clears throat> There's nothing good. So, uh, w- but here's another thing. You know, here's a, people who want to say, oh, it's okay to have multiple wives. You know, well, let's look at, here's one of many examples that will show us that having multiple wives is not a good thing. I mean, the Bible tells us it happens. Well, look at the bitterness and the resentment. And, and that it that it breeds. I mean, why did Penina go, why did she feel the need to do that? Maybe she knew that that her husband loved her more. You know, so she decided to find a way to get to her. You know, get her hooks in and, and you know drive one home. So she was going after her that way. You know, it'd be better if, if he had just the one wife. I would say Hannah, by the way, <laughs> for my thing I'm reading here. You know, have have the one wife and just love her, and then you know Hannah wouldn't be provoked year by year by this lady. So you know the case for multiple wives is just isn't there. You know every example is a bad one. I mean we could turn to other examples. I preached a whole sermon on it. You know we could talk about Leah and Rachel, how they fought over their husband, the bitterness, the anger, the jealousy, the resentment that they had that they had to share this man as their husband. You know and they were sisters. You know they grew up together. They probably even had fond memories and things, but you know they kind of went at each other too. So we can learn a lot of things just from these few verses, but the one thing I really want to kind of drive home tonight, because it's a big theme in this passage, this chapter, is that, you know, infertility, which is what this this is dealing with here, you know, the inability to bear children, is is not always caused by a physical defect on our part. You know, a lot of times people struggle to have children, and they start to go to unnatural means in order to have them. Because they instantly assume there must be something wrong with them. There must be something wrong with my spouse. You know, they go to, uh, what, I don't know what they even call it, you know, the clinic where they, they test everything and make sure everybody's, every, you know, every, all the, uh, everything's working, you know, and they, then they prescribe medicines and things. I don't know what all they do, right? You know, they do the invertebral fertilization and things like that. So they do all these different things, but 
people are shouldn't be doing that because they forget the fact that you know the Lord is the one who opens and shuts the womb. Right. That it's God that decides whether or not you're going to have a child. Amen. And not all infertility is necessarily the fault of the individuals involved, which is the case of Hannah. I mean, Hannah, and the Bible is very clear, it says that the Lord had shut up her womb, that he was the one who decided not to let her have children. And you say, well, why is it? Why would God do that? Well, the Lord had a purpose in Hannah's life, didn't he? And we see what it is here. Now it goes on here in verse 8 and it says, Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? Now, every time I've read that, I've tried to wrap my head around, like, where is he coming from? Is he right about this or not? You know, and then I, I think about how I am as a husband. I think, yeah, he probably is right. If he's anything like me, he probably is better than 10 sons, right? But I don't know. Maybe maybe he's not. <laughs> but one, you could, you could, I mean, I don't know exactly how to interpret this. Is he being insensitive? Is he just fed up every year? We come up here, you weep, you mourn. Maybe he doesn't know everything that's going on with Penina. He's just getting a little short tempered here. Or maybe is he actually making a valid point? You know, why are you weeping? You know, just because the Lord hasn't given you children, isn't aren't there things to be grateful for? Class, Hannah, I'm, I'm nothing to you. I'm just you know just a paycheck. You know, I'm just a roof over your head. I just give you the things you need, and that's it. Right. So I think Alcana does have a bit of a point here. You know, whether or not he's being insensitive, I I don't think so because I think this is something that went on for a long time. And, he, and it doesn't say that he did said this year by year, but it came to a point where he then said Elkanah to her husband to her. You know, this gone on and gone on, and finally he just says to her, look, why are you weeping? Why are you sad? I'm better to be than ten sons. And you know what? I, I think he's right. I think, you know, I mean, obviously without the husband, you don't have any chance for a son at all, you know, if you're going to do things right. So he is better to, to her than ten sons. Now, that's not to say that, you know, women naturally desire to have a child you know and that's not something that a husband that those feelings I don't I'm not a woman so I can't really speak to all this I don't know but you know that's the impression I get is that ladies you know there's something in them that wants to have a cuddly cute little baby to call their own they get the baby fever right and it's crazy because they'll have they'll have they'll have a baby and they'll go through all of that that we talked about on Mother's Day right all the hardships and the, and the dangers that go with it and you think, as a man, you go, surely they'll never want to do that again. <laughs> you know, and then a, you know, a little time goes by, they wean the child. Then some other lady, some friend of theirs has a baby. And they see that li- their, their baby's grown up. You know, the older they get, the less cute they are. It's just a fact of life. Right? The teeth start to fall out. It's not, it gets old. No, I'm kidding. But, I mean, but <laughs> you know, then they get around. Their kid's gotten a little bit bigger. They're out of that cute little, you know, baby thing where they just make the little faces and move their hands and do all the little baby stuff and then mom gets around that and all of a sudden she wants another one right they get baby fever you know <laughs> so there is something in them that just wants to have that that quite frankly Elkano as good of a guy as he seems to be he's never going to fulfill that need for her you know he's never going to be that for her but he does have a point here look you know be grateful for what you do have that's the lesson we can take away from this you know, say, well, I, I, we're, in, we're unable to have children. Well, you've got each other. You know, or, or, or I'm single. Well, you have the Lord. You have your church. There's always something that you do have that other people don't have. You know, we can look, we can start to feel sorry for ourselves in whatever position in life we're in. But you know what? We don't have to look very far to find somebody that has it maybe worse than us. You know, we say, well, we, we've been trying and we only have one child. You know, well, go, go to the couple that has zero children. That have been trying for decades and don't have any. You know, or you could say, well, we have kids, but it's been, told, you know, now it seems like we can't have any more. Well, be grateful for the children that you do have. You know, Salcana's making a good point here. Be grateful for what you do have and stop focusing so much on what you don't have. And it seems like it kind of got through to Hannah, right? And then she, so it says in verse 9, so Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a, a seat post by the, of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. So at least she's going to the right place to do something about this. You know, at least she's going to God and taking it to Him. 
You know, she's going to take her burden and leave it at the Lord's feet. That's the right thing to do in this situation. You know, you're, maybe the husband can't tell you exactly what you need to hear. You know, maybe, maybe life's just not going your way, but you can always go and pray unto the Lord. You know, that's the best place to take your problems is to God. And that's what Hannah did. So, you know, right, you can see right out of these just, you know, not even a dozen verses into this book where there's so many great lessons to learn out of this book. And I'm really looking forward to preaching the rest of it, too. But it says she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, that thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued and prayed before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. So he was, you know, he was there when she was praying, and you know, he, he marked her mouth in the sense that he took notice of what she was doing, okay? And it says, only her, now, that, now Hannah spake in her heart, only her lips moved. You know, this is like the kid that, that reads the book. I mean, I need to go see the adults in the room that do it, you know, but kids go through and they start to read it. And like they kind of read out loud, it's kind of mumbling. You know, help them read along. And eventually you have to say, hey, knock that off, right? That's probably kind of what's going on here. You know, there's, I, I don't imagine, I don't think she was completely silent. Maybe it was just kind of a muttering or a, a stammering or just, you know, a, a real hushed, type of talking that was indiscernible. But it was in her heart, and her mouth moved, her lips moved, uh, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. You know, he thinks, great, here comes this lady's coming to church drunk, you know. And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from me. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sour, sorrowful spirit. I have drunken neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial. That's an interesting statement right there in the light of everything that was just transpired. For out of the abundance of my complaint and the grief have I spoken hitherto. So it's interesting when she's mistaken for being a drunk in the house of God that she, she needs, feels the need to, to clarify the fact that she's not a son or a daughter of Belial. And we all know what Belial is in the Bible. It's the devil. So don't mistake me for you know a son of Belial, a son of the devil, or a daughter in her case, right? So, you know, just a quick side note, you know, we could preach, this could lead into a whole other sermon on drunkenness, right? You know, being a drunk is a good way to be mistaken for a son of the devil, a child of the devil. That's something that goes along with uh, Satan's crowd, the drinking, the intoxication. Right, yeah. You know, and you find that a lot amongst, amongst people that are heavily into that, you know, uh, the, the, the demonic, uh, you know, way of living. And whatever, I mean, like the rock and roll lifestyle, you know. Think about all the, the people, all the rock and rollers that have drunk themselves to death, that have choked on their own vomit from passing out drunk and vomiting. You know, the late singer of ACDC, which, you know, everyone was saying it stands for Antichrist Devil Child. You know, I'm on a highway to hell. Right. Yep. And he got there probably a little quicker than he cared to. Right. And what took him there? Drinking alcohol. You know, there's a whole sermon right there about how the devil's crowd likes to get drunk. Okay? It's true. So that's why, you know, he's mistaking her for a son of the devil, a daughter of the devil, right? Because she thinks she's drunk. That's all he did. He didn't notice, you know, some, you know, pentagram carved on her arm or something like that. You know, she had thick mascara and scars on her mouth. I thought, hey, you know, <laughs> you know she's, she's, she's dressed like a goth. She must be a son of the devil or a daughter of the devil. No, he thought she was drunk. That's it. Okay? Anyway, we'll move on. It says in verse 17, so she made, you know, she clarified, said, no, you know, I've come here to pour out my complaint before the Lord. You know, I'm not, I'm not drunk. I'm not a, a child of the devil. Then, in verse 17, Eli answered and said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou asked of him. And she said, let thine hand might find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. So when does Hannah kind of get over this? Is it when is it when Elkanah pipes up and tries to set her straight and remind her how good she's actually got it because she's married to him? You know, which there is some validity to that statement. She does have it good. There's probably a lot of ladies out there that don't have a husband even, right? That would like to have one. She's got one. Okay? <laughs> so he's reminded that. But when does she finally kind of get over it? After she goes to the Lord. Which again just shows us that 
you know, there's certain you're only going to get peace about certain things until you, if you take it to God. I mean, you can talk to the pastor, you can talk to your best friend, you can talk to other people in the church, you can talk to your spouse, you can get online and get and counsel there. But you know what? You'll never really have peace. You'll never know what to do or be able to get up and be no more sad about it and be able to just live your life and carry on until you take it to God. Yeah. And that's something that we all need to learn is that you know we should be taking our problems to the Lord. I mean, it's great. You know, the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You know, and a brother is born for adversity. We understand all that. But that's not who we should be leaning on the most. We should be leaning on the Lord like she did, like she learned to do. And then she was able to get up and her countenance changed, and she was no more sad. And what it also shows us, I believe, is that Hannah was a woman of faith. You know, she she didn't she didn't get anything back. You know, all she got from was you know from Eli. She went and prayed this prayer, and it wasn't like God the heavens opened and God spake to her and told her, "Oh yeah, your petition is granted." You. No, she just got the word from Eli. You know what? Go in peace, and the Lord granted thy petition. And she went up, and she went her way, and she had a changed countenance. When she went to God and left it there, she did that in faith. And, and that shows us that she's a great woman of faith. Yeah, amen. That she was able to just take it to God and say, you know what, this is in the Lord's hands. And just trust the Lord to, in, in his timing. <clears throat> it reminds me of you know, her forerunner, Sarah, which is another woman who you know, suffered from infertility. Didn't have her first kid until she was in her 90s, right? And what does it say about her? I mean, she's in the hall of faith, Sarah. You know, Hebrews 11, with all of those great people of faith, it says that Sarah, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she would judge him faithful who had promised. How did she do that? Through faith, it says. Through faith also, Sarah received strength to conceive seed. She did that by faith. You know, she didn't go and find a doctor to prescribe her something or perform some kind of operation or some kind of procedure, you know, she didn't, she didn't con, you know, she didn't try to, you know, go bought some unnatural method, she just took it to God and left it there, and said, the Lord, you know, will, will grant me see, or he won't, and she was, you know, and, and much like Hannah here, she just came to the place and said, you know what, I'm just going to leave with God, and if he wants me to have this child, I'm going to give that child back to him, right? And, you know, that's something we need to learn from if, if we struggle from this. And there's a lot of people out there that struggle with this thing of infertility. And maybe, you know, maybe we're not, self, you know, dealing with that here tonight, but maybe we will down the road. You know, maybe it'll be something that we have to deal with later in life. Or maybe it'll be somebody else that we know that will have, that will have to go through it. So this is always good to kind of remind ourselves of this encouraging fact that every barren woman who prayed for a child in the Bible got one. Because they did it in faith. And if you would, go over to uh, Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30. The Bible says in Genesis 25 that Isaac entreated his, the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So I remember Rebekah was another one that was unable to conceive seed. And she also got pretty upset about it. You know? and, and here's the thing. It says Isaac entreated for the Lord's sake. Her for the Lord, the Lord for his wife, excuse me, for Rebecca. He went to the Lord for her. So, you know, the husband kind of has his part to play as well. You know, and that's the thing, I, that's something I think husbands, we need to understand is that, you know, if our wife is struggling in this area, that's not just her problem. You know, that's, that's our burden to bear too. You know, and it's not, and by that, I don't mean just we have to put up with, you know, her emotions. She, her, she's down in the dumps about it. You know, we need to share that burden with her. Amen. You know, and we and if we're, you know, if we're chances are as husbands, we want that child just as much as she does. You know? <clears throat> so we should go to God as well. We should just say, well, that's her, you know, we'll just let her pray about it. No, Isaac took the time to go and pray about it too, for her his wife's sake. You know, and a lot of times, sometimes sometimes I wonder if that's what God's trying to do in some people's lives when the wife is struggling is maybe he's trying to get the husband's attention. Maybe it's not so much with the wife. Well, I've never gone to anybody and said that, I've never, and I never would, but I thought it, because, and I've known multiple people that have struggled with this over the years, and I think, man, I wonder if maybe they're doing that because the Lord, we always think it's, oh, something with the wife. God's trying to work with the wife, and it's like, well, maybe it's the husband. 
Maybe the God is trying to get the husband to a place where he'll get down on his knees and, and get along with God and pray. Because <clears throat> he has his part to play as well. Now you're there in Genesis chapter 30, another example of, of a lady who was unable to have children but did by the grace of God. Verse 20, or excuse me, verse 22. <laughs> and God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bare a son, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. <clears throat> so what we see from this, again, is that it is the Lord who opens and shuts the womb. That's what she said there. She said, The Lord, God hearkened unto her and opened her womb. So we have to remember, again, that when people are struggling with this, this is not always just because of some physical you know, uh, uh, fault in the people involved. Now, sometimes it is. You know, it could be bad nutrition. It could be, you know, uh, not taking care of ourselves, whatever. But a lot of times, you know, even when we're doing anything right, it's still not happening. It could just be that it's God, you know, working in our lives. And if you would, turn over to Psalm 113. Psalm 113. The Bible says in Genesis 29, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. So, you know, but Rachel's sister, you know, she was she was barren for a while, and he opened up her womb, right? The Bible says in Psalm, you're going to 113, it says in Psalm 127, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. You know, having children is the reward of God. But again, it's God that opens the womb. The fruit of the womb is his reward. It's something that he gives to people. And that's how we ought to look at children as a reward, every single one of them, and not, and not a burden to bear. Like many people treat their children today, and they go to these great lengths to not have kids or to have 1.8 children, you know, and then, and then they want, I mean, how would that make you feel to be that 1.8 child, right, second one or whatever, and then hear your parents say things like, well, that's it, we're done, I can't, I can't stand to have any more of these. <laughs> Right. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. And I've heard it said, and I believe this is a true statement. The best way to show your kids you love them, or one of the best ways, is to have more kids. I mean, think about it. If you're a child and then you see your parents continue to have kids as long as they're able, you know, that would say, boy, they do like having us around. They actually do enjoy, you know, putting up with us and everything that comes along with it. The good, the bad, the ugly. <laughs> So that's, that's something to think about, too, that the fruit of the womb is, the, is God's reward to us. Look there in Psalms 113, uh, verse, we'll begin in verse 1, it's a great psalm. It says, praise ye the Lord, praise, uh, O ye servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun and the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto our, the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? So he's praising God here, and he's you know giving a special uh, you know putting special emphasis on the fact that God is very high. That he is you know like the Bible says the Most High. Right. You know that he is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. I mean, God is so much far removed from us. He's so much greater than us. And he says in verse six, "Who humbleth himself." to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. You know, one of the great things of God is that how, no matter how great he, I mean, he truly is, we can't even comprehend, comprehend how great and lofty and high and holy God is, that his ways are above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. Yeah. But the Bible says that he humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. That God looks down into our little lives and is, and is interested in having a part in it. In me and in you. And in the scheme of things, who are we? Nobody. Uh, right. <laughs> Hate to break it to you, right? right. But, I mean, we're just another face in the crowd. We're just another, you know, we're, like the Bible says, you know, all flesh is as grass. Hmm. You know, we're just a vapor that appeareth for a little while and vanished away. We're here one day and we're gone the next. But God looks down from heaven and, 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 and he beholds the things that are in the earth. That, talking about our lives. It says, He raised up the poor out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and, and to be a joyful mother of children. 
So he's talking about how God condescends and looks down into earth. And, and, and you know, he, he beholds the things that are there. And he talks about, you know, certain situations that he gets involved in when he does that. Lifting the needy out of the dunghill. Who else is going to lift the needy out of the dunghill? Who wants to go deal with a guy in a dunghill? What are you doing in the dunghill, dude? Get yourself out. Come on top, right? But God says, well, let me lift you out of that dunghill. Clean you up. Other people are going to go, oh, man, keep away from me. Go take a bath. But God looks in and lifts that guy up. And what has he done with him? He made that, and, and that he may set him with princes. And even the princes of his people. So God can exalt people, right? So he's talking about some pretty lowly people. Then he talks about another situation. that When God, who is high above every the heavens, I mean, just, you can't even comprehend it. When he looks down on the earth and he holds the things of the earth, it says that he maketh the barren woman to keep house. I mean, ladies, I think they get a little despondent sometimes in these situations. They go, God doesn't care. God obviously doesn't, look, doesn't regard me. <clears throat> I mean, what was Hannah's prayer? You know, remember me. Don't forget me. You know, grant me my petition. And the Bible, the Bible says that he looks down and specifically uses this example. That he causes a barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. So that's one of those areas that, you know, we should never become despondent about. You know, that should be encouragement to ladies, you know, or any couple, rather, that is dealing with this in their life. They should never get this attitude that God just doesn't care, that God isn't paying attention, that God doesn't know about it. Because he says he does. And that he makes that woman to keep house. We looked at examples, but I can tell you examples I know personally of people that went years struggling to have children. And I'm not saying just struggling to get pregnant, but actually struggling to not only get pregnant, but then also to bring those children to term, which is a whole other set of heartaches there. And gone through great heartache over it. But eventually, you know what? They had their little bundle of joy one day. And they were joyful over that child. And the whole time, I guarantee you, God was involved. And God had a purpose behind it. Because the Bible says he does. <clears throat> but here's what I, you know, so we should not become despondent. We should not lose hope if we're struggling with this. But we don't want to go to the other extreme and get impatient and take matters into our own hands. <clears throat> you know, we should understand that God has a purpose. That God has a purpose between behind everything that he does. Even if he's, you know, shutting up the womb and he's not allowing that child to be born. You know, he's not allowing that conception to take place. God has a purpose behind it. Always understand that. You know, that's easy. it's easy for me to get up and just say that, but that's the biblical example. And that's what the Bible teaches. And God gives us so many examples like Hannah to teach us this. That in, specifically in this area, we should never become despondent and understand that God has a purpose. Always. <clears throat> I mean, think about the purpose in Hannah's life. I mean, Hannah, you know, her barrenness is what brought her to the place of being willing to dedicate Samuel to the Lord. I mean, what if God had just, you know, the, you know, the day after their marriage, you know, she conceived on their wedding night and they had a kid. Do you think she would have taken him and lent him to the Lord immediately? No. I don't think so. I think what she went through was God's working to bring her to the place so that she'd be willing to even do this, to offer this child. Because God needed to raise up a man. And we'll see that here in a bit when we get into the next couple chapters. That God had a purpose behind the whole thing. Now, I don't know what God's purpose is in everybody's life, what he's doing, and why he causes some people to go through this and others don't. But God always has a purpose. You know? and, and I bet if, if people would search their hearts and, and pray to the Lord, God would probably reveal their purposes to them, or his purposes of uh, why he's doing that. So understand that God has a purpose. You know, that's what brought Hannah to the place where she's willing to just lend this child to the Lord. Okay? Verse 19, back in 1 Samuel 1, it says, And they rose up early in the morning, and worshiped before the Lord, and returned and came to the house, to their house, to Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, she, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. So here, here Samuel finally shows up. And this is, you know, the guy who's the, for, uh, after which the book is named, right? So this is the kind of the key character. So there's a lot we can learn about Samuel from here on out. 
And I kind of want to just take the rest of the sermon tonight and just kind of make a few points, kind of remind, you know, to, to introduce us to Samuel, okay? Now, one of the first things that's interesting about Samuel is his name, okay? They didn't just, you know, we, when we pick names for babies, we just think, you know, did I know anybody that had that name that I didn't like? <laughs> or does that sound nice, you know? Are we, are we, what are, are we, uh, what do they call it, alliterating our children's names? You know, it's going to be Anna, Amy, uh, you know, just like all these, you know, A names or whatever. Now, that's not how they did it back then, at least not with Hannah anyway, okay? Now, Cana, you know, I don't have time to go in it, into it here, but he, he that was like a, a name that had been handed down for generations in his family, but Samuel here has a special name, and, and why that is is because of the fact that his name was a reminder that God hears and answers prayers. I mean, that's a great name, you know? Well, let me look at look at it. Uh, I mean, it's right there in the, in the uh, verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass, uh, when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, because I had asked him of the Lord. So why was his name Samuel? Because she asked him of the Lord. You know, Mom, why'd you call me that? Because God gave you to, you know, because I asked God for you, and he gave it to me. That's a great name that he was going to have with him for the rest of his life. That's what his name means, that God hears and answers prayers. It goes on, it says in verse 21, And the man of Cana and all his house went up to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up, and to the child be weaned. Then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and thereby forever. Now this isn't immediately on the surface, but I think there's a little bit of a principle here when it comes to child rearing, or child birth rather is that, you know, mothers who give birth should be should take it easy, you know. I was listening in a book on the way down, talking about, um, you know, the, the, the frontier days, and, you know, when they were, they were conquering, you know, New Mexico in that area, and this lady uh, that was uh, on the frontier with her husband, who was like a colonel or something, she miscarried, and in the room below her, uh, a Cherokee woman had given birth, and that night, like, like, the, like, Within 12 hours, the lady, that, that Indian lady, went out to the river with her baby and bathed herself in the baby in the night in a river. Okay, so <laughs> I don't have to do the sermon, right? <laughs> but I mean, there's some hardy people, right? Now, that's not Hannah here. She's not getting up and, you know, running up to the temple right away. Now, Sam, you know, if you want to do the whole take your baby down to the river after you just gave birth, you know, you go right ahead. But I believe that the Bible is showing us that. It's proper for a lady to take it easy and to recover from that very traumatic event. But we already had the Mother's Day sermon, right? So we'll move on here. And it says uh, in verse uh, 23, And Alkina, her husband, said unto her, No, get up and get back to church immediately, you lazy jerk. <laughs> right? No. He said, Do what uh, seemeth good, tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. You know, and that's, this is, you know, and I don't want to overdo it with this, but this is something that we need to keep in mind, that, that th this, this hyper-spiritual attitude of, I'm going to give birth on Saturday and be in church on Sunday is not healthy. Yeah. And I've been in churches like that, where it's just like, hey, I know you just had a kid, but I need you to go out and do your bus calling, and then Sunday I need you on the bus, and I need your wife, you know, at church, you know, and, the, and then the congregants are like, yeah, we gotta, we got to show how tough we are to get out there. You know, no, you need to take it easy, okay? I'm not going to preach all that, though. But that is there. I mean, you could probably read that into it, and Amen. it's legitimate. And it says here in verse 24, And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee uh, here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed... Uh, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. So it's great that it ends there saying, and he worshiped the Lord. So when Eli sees this, he says, well, praise God. And he worships the Lord as well. So that's, that's chapter one. But you know, before we close, I want to just point out a few things that we kind of read over real quick about Samuel. Because okay? Samuel is kind of the main character here starting out. So we see, first of all, what Samuel's names mean, but we have to also remember there's some other clues that we get about Samuel here, too. One is that he is a Nazarite. If you recall, she says that when she prays, it said that 
and no razor shall come upon his head. That's referring to the Nazarene, the vow of the Nazarene, right? And you find that in number six. Don't have the time to turn there and look at all that. But that was part of that vow. But they weren't going to eat anything of the grape. They weren't going to have any fermented drinks. They weren't going to eat anything of the vine. And they weren't going to shave their head. And they weren't going to defile their body, uh, defile themselves by, uh, you know, getting near the dead. Even if it was a mom or a dad. It was a, it was a very extreme vow that not everybody took. But, you know, Sam was put on Samuel before he even had anything to say about it. Right? But he, he was an Azraite. And not only that, and maybe these are maybe some more, uh, I think, interesting points about Samuel. If you would, go to Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3. Is that Samuel, he's, he's a real transitional character during the time of Israel. His, 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 uh, the time in his alive was, I mean, Israel went through a lot of changes, you know, in their government and other things. Um, there was a major transition. They went from, they were, you know, the ending in the book of Judges where the Bible says, you know, and every man did that which is right in his own eyes. Right, and then it kind of goes on from there, and then fi- you know, finally Samuel comes on the scene, and things start to change. You know, they hear that there's a prophet being raised up on the Lord, and Samuel was a prophet. Okay, and he 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 was a prophet, but he was also a priest. He fills a very unique role in Scripture. He's a very interesting character. If you look at Acts chapter three, verse twenty-two, it said, "For Moses, uh, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me." Him shall you hear in all things, but whatever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Of course, that's referring to Jesus Christ. Now, of course, Moses himself was a prophet as well. But Moses kind of, he was kind of a transitional figure in his time as well. When they're coming out of Egypt, they really, you know, like we talked about the other day where he said that Moses was a king under them, right? In the sense that he was a ruler. So he was a very transitional figure as well. But it's interesting here in verse 24, it says, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel until those, uh, and those that follow after, as many have spoken, li- have likewise foretold of these days. So Samuel, though he's not the first prophet, I mean, Moses was a prophet too, but he is the first prophet in a line of prophets that's mentioned here. That after him, you know, he kind of gets this ball rolling. That he's kind of a, a, a forerunner. Right? He's kind of a trailblazer in a lot of ways. And, um, and he's kind of, you know, he's a prophet, but he's kind of a real unique one. He's kind of like this, this, this restart uh, or a revival in, in Israel. So Moses came first, but Moses kind of serves, or excuse me, Samuel, he serves as kind of like this, this line of demarcation in their history. You know, he serves as this, this uh, symbol of transition between, you know, one method of rulership to another, going from the system of the judges under the system of the kings. He's a very instrumental person in that. You know, he transitioned them from one king to another, you know, from, from Saul unto David. So you see a lot of that in his life, him going from one form of government to another, from one king to another, from going, you know, him, and him fulfilling two roles, not just a prophet, but also a priest. Because if you recall in his lineage, you know, we could study this out in First Chronicles 6, it goes on, but he was a Levite as well. So he was a Nazarite, he was a Levite, he was a prophet, he was a priest, a very unique person. And you know, there's a lot of just really unique, wonderful things that we're going to learn about Samuel in this book. You know, especially in his childhood coming up. And uh, the, he was just a great man of God. <laughs> you know, and the first, but it's interesting that the first time you meet him, the first role he ever filled was Miracle Baby, right? You've all heard that you know the child that's born under these you know, these stressful circumstances, or people are told they're not this child's not going to live, or you know you're never going to have children, and they do. And when they call that child, they call that a miracle baby, and that's what Samuel was. <clears throat> so what that should show us is that you know God uses the weak things of this world to confound the mighty, and we need to we need to use this humble lady named Hannah. So all she just wanted was a baby. And God worked in her life and brought the birth of this man of God called Samuel, who fulfills all these unique roles. All just very interesting. He wasn't just an ordinary prophet. I mean, he was a prophet, a priest, he did all these things. So what we can take from this, hopefully tonight, is that we should never underestimate our difficult circumstances. You know, not just think that our circumstances or our situations are difficult for no reason. That God always has a purpose behind them. Maybe we can't always see what it is. Maybe we can't always see what's on the other side of this trial that we're going through. 
But God always has a purpose. Right. You know, but that difficult circumstance, that might be the very thing God is using to accomplish his will in your life. Mm. Just like Hannah. You know, he, he caused her barrenness. That would, he caused that. I mean, the Bible says, you know, he's the one that opens and shuts the womb. He says he shut up her womb right. and caused all this grief in her life. Not for the sake of that, for the sake of bringing her to the place where she would dedicate that child to the Lord so that God could do a great work through that boy, through that man. And none of that would have happened without her, and without her faith, and without her difficult circumstances that she had to go through. So don't ever underestimate it. It might just be what God's using to work in your life. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, again, thank you for uh, the example of Hannah. Thank you that she was a woman of faith. Help us to be uh, people that are uh, also be people of faith, Lord, that we would always trust you, that we bring our burdens to you, Lord, that we wouldn't just express them to those around us, but we would bring them to the one person that can do far above that which we could ask or think, Lord, that we would bring them to your throne, the God of all comfort, and leave them at your feet so that you could do a work in our lives. And Lord, help us to always trust you and know that you're working for our good, Lord, if we love you. Help us to be people that love you, Lord. I pray that you just be with the rest of this book, help me to preach. Uh, through it so that we can glean from it. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and sing another song before we go. We'll sing song number 18, Take the Name of Jesus with You. <clears throat> song number 18.
Thank you.